Okay, we pick up the story on representation. This is, without a doubt, the most complex topic we will deal with in this module. We did the first half on Tuesday. We're going to wrap it up today. The issues that arise when we ask how our knowledge is organized, what way we should think about knowing, and what, in particular, we role we should apportion to the brain in all this, these are difficult questions, and there are many, many, many sides to them. In order to simplify things the last day, we started by looking at not brains, but maps. Maps bear a relation to something that's not there. They are about something. And we're familiar with maps, so we can use these to structure our thinking about this. We noted that in the map, there are various ways in which the lines and colors on the map are about something that's not there, about Salt Lake City in this case. We saw that there are symbols which have an arbitrary <coughs> relationship to things which are not there, established solely by convention. That doesn't bother us. We're expert symbol users. But that way of being about something requires that we be expert symbol users, and it requires that, for example, there be a legend, there be a, some kind of a key that tells us or establishes the relationship between a symbol and something in the real world. We saw a star standing for an entire city the last day. Other information in the map is of a different nature. Some information is directly present, easy, low-hanging fruit. The names of things, for example, are just given there. You can just read the names of things on the map. If you want to figure out how far apart two points in the real world are, you, that information is also in the map, but it's a lot more work to get at. You have to take a piece of string, lay it down on the map, trace out the shapes, compare it to a scale, and convert that from centimeters to kilometers, or from inches to miles. So there's different ways in which the information on the map is about the real world, and some of the information is readily available, and some of it we have to work for. Some information is simply not there. There's nothing about the smells and the sounds of Salt Lake City on that map, as I'm sure you'll agree. One way in which something can be about something that's not present is if there's a, like, something like a trace or an imprint. And we saw these two examples of a kiss and a hand that has been pressed into clay. Now, you can take these traces and you can <coughs> stretch them, compress them, extend them, and you'll change the relative size of things, but there's some things you won't do. You won't introduce a third lip, for example, or you won't reverse the positions of the fingers. You might change their relative size, but some spatial relations in particular are going to remain unchanged. And we saw this in nervous systems when we consider the relationship between sensory surfaces like the retina or the skin or the basilar membrane in the ear and those pieces of the brain, the sensory cortices, to which these project. We saw in the monkey brain the relationship from the retina to the primary visual cortex. This brain has been opened up at the back. To restore this brain, you would have to fold those two together. On the retina, you can see the fovea, which is a small black spot, and it projects to the large black area in the brain. So the relative size has changed. But two locations which are adjacent in the retina will still be adjacent, they'll be close to one another in the cortex. We won't reverse the position of things. We saw something similar when we considered the relationship between the sensitive touch receptors on the skin, which project to primary somatosensory cortex in the brain. And that allowed us to reconstruct this grotesque homunculus, which shows the relative amount, the, the kind of distortions that we get. So an awful lot more brain is devoted to the hands and the mouth than to the knees and the elbows, for example, for obvious reasons. So that was vision, and that was touch. And then in the auditory domain, we also saw here, using the example of a cat brain, we saw that the arrangement in the ear, where sounds are analyzed into their frequency components, from low frequencies to high frequencies, that maps to the cortex so that we find sensitivities in primary auditory cortex from low frequencies to high frequencies. In each of these three cases, and they're the only three, they don't stand for perception generally, but these three are very specific. There are maps that go from the sensory surface to the brain, which preserve some relations and also introduce these spatial distortions. That's a way in which what's going on in the sensory surfaces 
can be related to what's going on in the brain, and in that way, what's going on in the brain is about what's going on in the sensory surfaces. That's one sense of about. It's a very grounded, strong sense of about. We understand it. There are bigger questions when it comes to this kind of symbolic thinking, where the cat's thinking about a cheeseburger, and we have to ask, in what sense can a thought be about something which is not there? Now, the word thought is, of course, extremely poorly defined. Nobody knows, really, what, how to speak properly about thoughts. We've seen a big tradition within cognitive science of thinking of some aspects of thought as being like language. Now, language is a symbol system par excellence. A word is a symbol that stands for something, and it does so in that arbitrary fashion, which is constructed by convention. The sound horse bears no physical causal relation to a horse in the real world, but it's established by a community of users who use that word in a certain way. And you are all expert symbol users, expert English speakers. For you, the relationship between the word horse and the animal out there needs no further explication, but it is arbitrary and conventional. Now, Jerry Fodor introduced a language of thought hypothesis which emphasized the role that language-like structures or propositions play in our thought economy. But a lot of people weren't happy with that, and we had good fun the last day opening up the idea of some thought aspects of thought as being like images or pictures as well. So we had fun imagining blue hippopotamuses wearing yet Wellington boots pointed right or left, um, and that kind of thing. This is a long-standing debate within cognitive science. There's been a lot of experimental work, some of it showing that we clearly use language-like structures, some of it, as in these mental rotation experiments, showing that some of our thought processes are more like the manipulation of spatially distributed objects. You may remember that the amount of time subjects took to mentally rotate one of these and fit it to the other depended on the amount of time that they would have had to physically rotate, the amount of distance that it would require to physically rotate one onto the other in space. And then we finished up with some questions that showed that the way that the knowledge that you have is organized greatly affects what you can do with it. So we saw that a sum expressed in Arabic notation with our numerals supports arithmetic. It's quite easy to do arithmetic on that. But if we translate the same information into a different representational scheme, Roman numerals, addition and multiplication become really, really hard. And we saw other examples. We saw that the information in a phone book is organized in a particular way that makes it easy to look up a number given a name, but makes it difficult to look up a name given a number, despite the fact that the information is in there, nevertheless. And then we started asking not about phone books or numerals, but about your knowledge. And we found that your, your knowledge about bands supports considerations of likeness, but not considerations of spelling. And your knowledge of the sounds of English supports rhyme. So rhyme is somehow informative about the way that your knowledge of words works. So you can see this is a rich topic. We covered a lot of ground in that lecture. And we've got a lot more to cover. And we're asking all the time about what knowledge is, how we should think about this. It's not going to be one thing. There's going to be different kinds of ways of thinking about knowledge and knowing. And one question we're going to have is, how is that knowledge organized? Can we uncover anything about its organization? For example, by experiments or by asking questions. And another question we're going to have as we go forward is, what kind of role do we think a brain plays in this? Remember, a brain is a lump of meat. It's not a soul. Um, we have to ask what its role is in the evidence that we have of knowing stuff. Now, here's some stuff that I know. I know the capital of Ireland is Dublin. I know how to tie my shoelaces. They don't give you a PhD for nothing. And I can find my way from my bedroom to the kitchen in the dark. Let's just think about these three spectacular feats of knowing that I'm exhibiting here, and, and which of them might be said to involve my head, my brain. Well, we'll look closely at the first one. It's a kind of a proposition. It's a sentence. The capital of Ireland is Dublin, which I can produce when required. We'll have a lot to say about that kind of knowledge, because there's been a great focus on this linguistic kind of knowledge. But we all know that that only captures some of our mental economy. My knowledge of tying shoelaces is something I can only exhibit in the presence of shoelaces. I would have great difficulty describing it. 
I couldn't draw it to save my life, but I can demonstrate it if shoelaces are there. So it only exists in the presence of shoelaces, and it's not linguistic. My knowledge of finding my way from my bedroom to the kitchen in the dark is even more context-bound. It only exists in a particular place. I can only demonstrate this knowledge. It only really exists in my house. <laughs> so it would be really funny or weird to suggest that that knowledge is in my head, wouldn't it? If the only place it can be found is in my house. So we're going to look first, though, because this is where most work has been done, at that first kind of knowledge, the kind of knowledge that you can write down in sentences, in facts. The capital of Ireland is Dublin. You're all blown away, huh? That's explicit knowledge that can readily be expressed in language. And it can be disconnected from any specific context. You can come up to me when I'm sitting on the beach sipping, sipping a cocktail in the Caribbean, as I want to do, and you can say, hey, what's the capital of Ireland? And I'll say, the capital of Ireland is Dublin. I don't have to be in Dublin. I don't have to be, well, I have to be awake, but you know, I, I carry this knowledge around with me. So to that extent, we would expect this somehow to be contained, well, may, maybe in my brain, maybe in my brain and body, but somehow it's something that travels with me, unlike my knowledge of getting from my bedroom to my kitchen, which doesn't travel. So in that respect, we might ask how this particular knowledge is represented. And we've seen the kind of way we can get at that by asking questions. What's easy? What's difficult? What's impossible? We have very great stocks of this kind of propositional knowledge. In fact, the number of facts I can express is virtually infinite. And so one thing that psychologists have done, psychologists and cognitive scientists have, from different disciplines, is figure out what kinds of questions you can ask that reveal how this knowledge is organized. What's easy to get at? What's difficult to get at? What can you not get at? Let's consider the way this was approached, first of all, within the early days of artificial intelligence, when it was assumed that intelligence was, what, was a good way of describing what minds are or do, and that most of that was connected with these kind of facts, factual knowledge. And the challenge then was to build artificial systems that seemed to be intelligent. And this was computer scientists on the job, so they knew all about data structures, and they knew how to express language-like sentences and put them into databases. <coughs> and so if you just put all the things that I know into a database, it's going to be a very big database, and I don't know how to enumerate all the things that I know. Supposing I know some things about dogs and I know some things about cats. There's a few things I know about cats. They dislike water, chases mice, likes to be petted. There's some things I know about dogs, likes water, likes to be petted. They're both animals, they're both mammals. The number of things I know about dogs and cats is really huge, and I'm not sure that listing a bunch of sentences would be a good way to get at them. Also, if you look at this, there's massive redundancy there. I, I know that a cat is a suitable animal as a pet, and so if it gets sick, I take it to a vet. I know the same thing about a dog. So does that mean I need to store in my database somewhere the sentence a cat is, uh, makes a good pet, a cat when sick should be taken to the vet, and store the same thing about dogs. Well, that seems very, very redundant. And so, boiling this kind of thing down to make it less redundant and more efficient gave rise to this kind of data structure used in early artificial intelligence systems. This is called a semantic network. It expresses some kinds of relationships of meaning, which could be expressed as sentences. The boxes there, we'll call them nodes, are similar to nouns in language. So cat and dog, mammal, animal, fur. There are links between them, and the links have names which are similar to verbs. So a cat is a mammal, a mammal is an animal, a dog is a mammal, a mammal is an animal. Imagine this were much larger. This is obviously too small to be serious. But if this were much larger, then it's less redundant than the previous one where everything was listed explicitly. So I don't have to explicitly list here that a cat is an animal, or that a dog is an animal. I can trace a path out, because all mammals are animals. If I've noted that a cat is a mammal, then I can infer, I can, the information is available to me, that a cat is an animal. But it might take me longer to get at than the idea that a cat is a mammal. 
This is not a serious psychological model at this scale with these few entries and those tiny little links. But the basic idea is clear. The idea is that maybe we could organize all our factual knowledge like this, and then we could find out if we're close to the way that any individual human does it by asking them questions. Some information is easy to get at here. A cat is a mammal. Some is more difficult. A cat is an animal, because I have to go through two links. And some is not possible. I like cats. I didn't put that in here, so it's not available. OK, that's one way of thinking about the organization of this factual kind of knowledge. And at its heart, we have these things, these nodes, the cat, dog, mammal, animal. These seem to be kind of categories with which we interpret the world. Categories are an essential element to the way that we understand the world. When you walk out there, you don't just see a blur. You see a building and a tree and a person. You're seeing them as trees, as buildings, as people. Those are categories. And the investigation of the categorical basis of human knowledge is 2,000 years old at least. An old idea, going back to Aristotle, is that we recognize something as a member of a particular category if it has the kind of things that you'd expect of something in that category. So I recognize something as a bird if it has wings and feathers and two legs and a beak and lays eggs and flies. Hang on, not all birds fly, right? So maybe that's, uh, you know, if I find something which has feathers and is flying, that's sufficient to recognize it as a bird. But maybe flying is not necessary because penguins and ostriches don't fly. And that gives rise to the idea that we might list features which are necessary and features which are sufficient. So here's some, uh, some examples. We've just done a bird. Now, we said that flying doesn't seem to be necessary to identify something as a bird. It's, it's even not sufficient because there are animals that are not birds that fly. But it's getting there, and maybe some collection of features might serve. Being the head of the Roman Catholic Church seems to be pretty much both necessary and sufficient to identify someone as a pope. At least it was when I made these slides a few years ago. These days there's two popes in Rome, one's in retirement and one's the active pope, and so this has got crazy as well. That was my single, clearest, most simple example. <sighs> you never know when an extra pope is going to come along and mess up your slides, right? A planet. Okay, maybe there are sufficient... In fact, you recently Pluto was demoted from its position as a planet. There was a bunch of astronomers got together, and they established necessary and sufficient conditions, and they said, Pluto fails. It's now a mini-planet, or not a planet, anyway. Some people were unhappy, some were happy, but they were trying to adopt this idea of necessary and sufficient features in order to clarify things. This doesn't work, basically. What's, supposing feathers, we establish feathers as a necessary feature for birds, because all birds have feathers, and no non-birds have feathers. Uh, feathers. Well, what if I get a chicken and I pluck it? Now it ain't got no feathers. Did it stop being a chicken? I don't think so. So you can see there's going to be always boundary problems here. Concepts, oh sorry, categories are really, really important. They represent classes of things, individual concepts. They don't represent specific items. So your name, John Doe, picks out you as an individual. But most words that we use to refer to things in the world pick out classes of things, categories. This is, is how we think. We think in terms of categories, and we speak using words that refer to categories. The word horse doesn't refer to a particular horse. It refers to the concept of horse. <coughs> so that every time we see something, we're categorizing. Now you can see that this business of knowledge organization has as much to do with perception, how we see the world, how we interpret the world, as anything else. And you might think the world comes with certain categories. There just are penguins and dogs and trees and birds and furniture and football and so on. Maybe, maybe not. One thing we immediately have to face is that the categories that you see the world in, that you understand the world in, are largely rooted in your language and your culture. If we go to a different language and a different culture, we'll probably encounter different categories. If that's not clear to you, Let's consider the language, the Dirba language, which is an Australian Aboriginal language. In this language, there's one category, Baiyi, 
which includes men, kangaroos, possums, bats, most snakes, most fishes, some birds, most insects, moon storms, rainbows, boomerangs, and some spears. And that's not to be confused with the category of balan, which includes women, bandicoots, dogs, platypuses, echidnas, some snakes, some fishes, some birds, scorpions, crickets, the hairy mary grub, water or fire, sun, stars, shields, some spears, and some trees. We all clear on this? There will be an exam. I have no clue how the categories work in this language. I'm not from that culture. If you're a speaker of this language, those categories are clear to you. I'm going to hazard a rough guess that it's entirely opaque to you. It is to me. I have no idea how this works. So the categories, the way that we divide up the world, the way that we understand the world, is deeply rooted in our culture and our language as well. It's not just that the world comes with these natural kinds. So let's get closer to home. Let's leave these uh, bizarre categories from Dierbal behind. And let's consider something nice and easy like a chair. There are some chairs. They are all chairs. I hope we'll agree on that. They're not necessarily all equally typical chairs. The chair on the far left, for example, is unique in that it's made for killing people. Most chairs are not made for killing people. I think we can agree on that. And the chair on the right is only for, for lifeguards to sit in. That's a bit kind of special, the chair that only lifeguards. The two chairs in the middle are much more, we might say, prototypical. They're much more, well, typical is another way of saying that. Prototype means an abstraction drawn from lots of examples, which is reasonably central to the concept. Now, when I go out and I see something new, and I, I see it, and I go, oh, look, there's a chair. I've obviously done some categorization. And there's two ways to think about this. I assure you, I have lots of experience with chairs. I've seen very many chairs in my life. And when I go and see something new and I, I consider it to be a chair, I'm not comparing it to every chair I've ever seen in my life. That would not be and everything I've ever seen in my life. What I'm doing is I'm comparing it to some kind of abstraction of the category chair that, I, that I've developed over the years to a prototype. And so we can see... Here on the left, you can see, there's, imagine those dots are all the chairs I've seen, and now I encounter a new one there, and you can see I'm comparing it to something like the center of gravity of all the chairs I've seen, to the, uh, to the mean, the average, the kind of rough figure of the Ur chair, distinct from any individual chair. And that only works if I've seen a lot of chairs. If I'm encountering something new, like someone comes along and they've got an Oculus Rift, and I don't have a big wealth of experience with virtual reality devices. And now tomorrow I go out and I see something else. I go, that's like the thing I saw yesterday. It's an Oculus Rift. It's a VR headset. That's like the thing I saw yesterday. So I'm not comparing it to a big class of things because I have very little experience with virtual reality headsets. I'm comparing it to a specific thing. That's comparing it to an exemplar. So when I encounter something, I'm comparing it to something specific that I've seen. Now, we probably need both of these ways of relating something new to our past experience. It takes a while to develop a prototype. I need to see a lot of chairs before I can be sure that something that new that I see is a chair and not, for example, a stool. And there will still be gray areas. How many of you think you're sitting on a chair right now? How many of you don't think you're sitting on a chair right now? Well, this one. <laughs> It's a questionable chair. It doesn't have legs, for example. Where's the legs on it? Is it a bench? It's somewhere between a bench and a chair. Many of you are sitting on a bench right now. Nobody's sitting on a bench. Okay. <laughs> You're all sitting on the same thing. We can agree with that. So categories have sort of fuzzy boundaries about them. And when we meet something, if we have a lot of experience, we're probably comparing it to a prototype. Prototypes are useful if we want to store this knowledge somehow because we won't have very many prototypes. I don't have to remember every chair I've seen in my life. Exemplars are expensive, but there again, we only will use this for something that's relatively new where we have little experience and where we have to compare something new with something specific that we've seen. So we're getting somewhere. We're beginning to realize that our, our knowledge of the world includes the division of things into categories. And these categories go from the most specific to the most abstract. Suppose I said for you, I got you something, and you said, oh, great, what is it? I said, it's a thing. You go, mm-hmm. Well, I told you what it was. 
Yeah, but you didn't tell me what it was. I told you in the most abstract sense possible, and you're none the wiser, right? So categories are not only organized from the most general to the most specific. Somewhere in the middle, there's what we'll call a basic category, a basic level category. This idea comes from Eleanor Rush, who also pointed out the distinction between prototypes and exemplars. She said that at the basic level, categories are maximally distinct. Things within one category are very like each other, and things that are from different categories are quite distinct from each other. Suppose I said to you, imagine a fruit. Some of you are imagining raspberries, some of you are imagining bananas, some of you are imagining apples. But if I said imagine an apple, you're all imagining more or less the same thing. If I said imagine a Granny Smith apple, it's not going to change much. Is it? So Granny Smith is a real specialization that doesn't really change much. The basic level category here is probably apple. If I likewise said to you, imagine a piece of furniture, it's not very specific, it's kind of abstract. If I said imagine a table, that would probably be a basic level category. So here's the same idea. Categories aren't just organized from the most general to the most specific. The kind of cognitively basic ones are the ones that you will imagine when I ask you to imagine something. And we generalize by moving up towards more abstract categories, and we specialize by making things more specific um, below the basic category. So let's consider these. We go out there and we see a load of people kicking a ball around. If I say, oh, look over there, there's a bunch of people sporting. That would be a bit odd. Even odder if I said, look, there's some people involved in an activity. And it wouldn't be very specific. You're more likely to say, look, they're playing football. If you we were very specific, you might say, look, they're playing under 15s football. That's kind of an insider thing. And your basic level category is, again, not given by nature. It's given, it's part, it, this represents the way that your knowledge is organized for you. I'm not an antique dealer. For me, a table is a basic level category. And yeah, I know there's different kinds of tables, but I'm not real good at listing the different kinds of tables. Furniture is definitely more general than that because it includes mirrors and chairs and stools and benches and all kinds of things. And if, if you say, I, I got something for you, it's an object, you're not really given any information at all. I'm not real good with birds. For me, there's just birds, right? There's little brown birds and little white birds. And I, I know a few birds, but I'm not, especially when it comes to those white ones. Telling the herring gull from a blackback gull from a tern from the petrel, I'm really not good at that. So for me, those sort of subcategories don't really exist, and your, your, your white bird there is a fairly basic thing. An ornithologist might have his gull as a basic category with specializations, because they know 17 different kinds of gulls, and they'd never mistake a gull for a thrush, for example. So your, what counts as a basic level category is going to depend on what you personally know, what skills you have. Now, all this is talking about categories and so on in your specific stock of knowledge as it features in sentences that you might speak, in the kind of facts that you might state. And so some of this we might expect to, well, to bear a relation to what's going on in your brain. But opinions differ greatly as to how much we should rely on that. If you ask me what I know, yeah, I can issue a lot of sentences. In fact, I'm pretty damn good. I stand up here and I talk at you guys twice a week all the time. I never seem to shut up. But I know that primarily because I have this baby with me and I'm checking my slides. I know that because I have the slides and they're helping me out. So we have this idea that some of our knowledge is offloaded. It's present in books. It's present in, if any of you have seen, um, what's the film? Memento, where someone is, has uh, lost his memory and he starts getting tattoos and the film is told backwards. It's a really good film. Recommend it. That's the first of many films we'll need today. Okay. We offload an awful lot of stuff. So some of our knowledge maybe is really out there in the world, and what we carry around with us is the ability to access it, the ability to use it. Thinking of everything as being in the head is an old, old mistake. It goes back to Descartes, and people speak sometimes of the Cartesian theater. Um, here you see a person, and if we imagine all this person's knowledge and experience as being in the brain, then we've got something out in the world getting in through the eyes, and we've got representations <coughs> being built up, but inside, you can see a bunch of little people analyzing it. Because if you have a representation like a word, horse, that only functions if there's someone to whom it is a representation. If it works for someone, someone has to interpret a symbol. They don't interpret themselves. 
and you don't actually have little people inside your head. That's called a homuncular fallacy, suggesting that your brain knows, your brain decides, your brain judges. That's putting little yous inside your head. Another film for you. How many people here have seen Being John Malkovich? So watch Being John Malkovich. It's a wonderful film. You're getting lots of film homework today. In Being John Malkovich, there's this secret door, and it leads to inside John Malkovich's head. So people go inside his head, look out through his eyes at the world, partly control his body. They're a little bit funny on that bit. And then after 15 minutes, get dumped out. Here you go. There's a tiny door in my office magazine, and it takes you inside John Malkovich. There's no such thing as a hole in somebody's brain. Yes, there is. You see the world in John Malkovich's eyes? And then after about 15 minutes... That's not me! I didn't say that! You're spinning out into a ditch on the side of the New Jersey turnpike. It was amazing. Where the hell are we? We're about to reach subconscious. Do you think that it's kind of weird that John Malkovich has a portal? I mean, do you think that it might have some sort of significance? What is going on? Huh? I discovered that portal. It's my head! John Cusata. Cameron Diaz, Catherine Keenan, and John Malkovich. Okay, we have to move along. It's a wonderful and slightly silly conceit, but it makes it very clear that thinking of little people inside your head is a bit of a bizarre way of going about it. We shouldn't really do that with brains. Um, okay, back in the middle of the 20th century, there was a shift in the way people thought about brains. They started using the language of information processing and they started thinking of brains as being symbol manipulation devices. And that was very representation heavy. It suggested that you want to get knowledge into the system by symbolic expression, by coding it somehow as facts and putting it into the system. And this got a real test then when people started building robots that do things in the world. The robots have to have some knowledge to get around in the world. And here's a bit of text, I won't read it out to you, but it's from Rodney Brooks, who developed robots in MIT. And he found that he, he expected, at the start of his work, to need clever brains full of facts. And he found he didn't. He needed clever bodies that matched the environment. He found he didn't need to represent the world. The world was simply there and could be relied on. It was, in a way, its own best representation. He had to worry about making sure things didn't fall over, making sure that the robots, as he said, got down and dirty with the environment and interacted with the environment at every step. So he was worried about the match between the robot and the environment. And we can con contrast these two views with this picture which we've seen before. On the left-hand side, you have the Cartesian representational view. There's a person looking at a scene and creating an internal picture of the scene. So no direct contact with reality. And here's a person on the Brooks view of things, immersed in the world, whose knowledge is uh, supported by the world and is present in context. I'm not suggesting one of these views is right or wrong. Remember the, the difference between my knowledge that the capital of Ireland is Dublin, that's a bit like the far one, and my ability to get from my bedroom to the kitchen in the dark, that's very like this one. So knowledge is not one thing. Some of it can be expressed in language-like fashion and will lend itself to representation. Some of it we need to look instead at the relationship of the whole organism to the environment. Now, another film. Who here has seen The First Matrix? You're really missing out if you haven't seen it. Watch The First Matrix. Matrix 2 and 3 are complete rubbish. Matrix 1 is much, much better. Okay? And it starts off with this brilliant idea, which is a take on a venerable thought experiment in philosophy from Hilary Putnam, who died two weeks ago. The idea is the brain in a vat. In the Matrix, people are literally in vats. People are being farmed for some questionable kind of bioenergy, and they have no clue of their fate. They have electrical signals jacked into their brain, which provide the right electrical signals to convince them that they're walking around in 1999 in the free air. It all works fine, and it works greatly to the benefit of machines. Is it coherent? Well, if you think all knowledge resides in the brain and that knowing and experiencing is a matter of sending the right electrical signals to the brain, it's coherent. But I hope we've, we're recognizing now that it's probably not going to hold up. It was, however, a popular view several decades ago at the birth of the field of artificial intelligence. In the field of artificial intelligence, there's always been this 
attempt to build artifacts that seem intelligent. And some of that, what we, whatever you mean by intelligence, is going to influence what, you, what counts as success here. Early attempts look like this. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. That's Hal from 2001 A Space Odyssey. There's no body. There's no person there at all. There's just this disembodied, abstract, floating intelligence. And then a lot of work has gone on to building more embodied things, robots of various kinds, and sometimes they're like humans and sometimes they're not like human. And there's this weird thing that happens, which is that as they get more like humans, so that's not like human, that's more like human, the degree to which we find them acceptable or nice or familiar varies. First of all, as they get more like human, it goes up. And the dotted line is for things that move, and the dark line is for things that don't move. Initially, we're quite glad that things are moving and bouncing around. And then suddenly, as they get too human-like, they get really, really creepy. We call this the uncanny valley. And then they have to get a lot better again to get out of the uncanny valley. Here's a video on the topic. Well, he looks nothing like a human, he's not creepy at all. Because I can communicate in many of the ways that people do. I can tell you that I'm sad, mad. Yeah, you bet. I'll call you, call you back in uh, within an hour. Okay. Right to the North Pole, of course. This is the Polar Express! Mighty and all power. This is, I promise. Image Metrics is a markerless performance driven animation company. We specialize in high quality facial animation for video games and films. I mean, really? Can we just skip that question? They really, really are bad. Not good. I have no idea if these really remind you of dying and mortality, but I do know that some of them are really, really creepy. So that's kind of bizarre. As we make things that look more like us, suddenly we want to stop looking like us. <laughs> I don't know, it's really interesting. So, back in the early days of artificial intelligence, when the idea was that knowledge was abstract, intellectual, linguistic, the kind you could write down in sentences, then there seemed an easy way to answer this question <coughs> if you want to build a system that's going to be intelligent, and the end result here would be something more like HAL, not like a robot, then here's the simple approach, add more facts. So you can express these facts as propositions, as sentences. And here's, we've met this before, this is an early artificial intelligence program called Shurlu. Here's a user is interacting using language. Notice the role of language here. And the world is a very much a simple, a toy world in which there's only a limited number of things, a very finite set of things that can happen. And under these circumstances, these very controlled circumstances, it works quite well. Shurlu could learn some things. It sort of could express what it knew and what it didn't know. And it 
interacted using natural language. But these toy worlds or block worlds don't scale up to the real world. In the real world, you need something much less tangible, much harder to define. You need common sense. If I tell you that Nora went into the house, and then I unexpectedly ask you, where's Nora's nose? Well, you don't have any problem answering it. If Nora went into the house, her nose went into the house. You don't need an extra sentence in your head saying, where Nora is, there is also is her nose, right? That would be a bit ridiculous. Your common sense knowledge grounds that, but it doesn't do so by virtue of being listed as a sentence. The biggest of these kind of sentence-based, fact-based reasoning systems is called Psych. And the owners of this, it was a commercial project, promise you the world. They promise programs that reason with the sum of all human knowledge. It seems like this is a great promise, and indeed they have vastly overpromised this kind of world of intellectual, abstract, fact-based knowledge store. What these things can't do is exhibit common sense. The set of facts that could be relevant to solving any real-world problem is infinite. The real world is unpredictable by its very nature. Small, constrained toy worlds don't work. They don't scale up. That's known as the frame problem, and you can think of it as Nora's nose problem, if you like. There's no limit to the number of questions that a real intelligent system has no problem answering, but that an artificial system would have to be told explicitly. Computers now can, are the best chess players in the world. The game of Go has recently fallen. Some of your required reading for this week is this system from IBM, Watson, which can play this game Jeopardy by mouthing out facts. It's interesting that that most recent of them, the AlphaGo, the Google, Google product that can play the game of Go, can't put its own store stones on the board. Right? It can say, it can print out where the stone is to go, but it has no embodied component at all. And so here we reach a really weird paradox that has arisen as a result of lots and lots of work in artificial intelligence. It's known as Moravec's paradox. And basically, the human faculty of reason that Descartes valorized so much and that the theologians have held as being the thing that sets man apart from the brute beast, reasoning is actually quite simple. You can do it using computation, and we have systems now that can reason. They're not alive. They don't think. They're not sentient. Doing the animal stuff, getting around in the world, exhibiting sensory motor skills, dealing with the unpredictableness of the world, that's difficult, requires huge resources, and is very much an unsolved problem. In the same vein, here's a quote from Steven Pinker. The main lessons of 35 years of AI research is that the hard problems are easy, and the easy problems are hard. The mental abilities of a four-year-old that we take for granted, like recognizing a face, lifting a pencil, or walking across a room, in fact, solve some of the hardest engineering problems ever conceived. And I suggest that as we develop more and more uh, intelligent systems, it's the stock analysts and the petrochemical engineers and the parole board members, they might be replaced by machines someday. It's the gardeners and the receptionists and the cooks who are not in danger of being replaced by machines. So we've had this shift, we've, or rather this recognition that this kind of abstract conceptual knowledge, which is the foundation of the discipline of artificial intelligence, it's very important to understand. We need to understand um, that side of ourselves, but we don't get to um, a, a proper, a full view of mind or of our capacity to act in the world in this way. In fact, I think we can convincingly demonstrate that intelligent, perceptual, searching activity, exploratory activity with purposes in mind can be done with no brain whatsoever. Here's, we'll just finish up with this example of a pea plant, which has no brain, which is searching around intelligently in its environment for something that can support climbing. And there you go. It found something and now it can climb. And I assure you a pea plant has no brain whatsoever. So this business of dealing with the world is probably not to be solved using this kind of abstract linguistic-like representation. So that concludes our um, coverage of this very complex topic of knowledge representations, and we've covered an awful, awful lot. I hope we haven't... Uh,
confused you too much. If you didn't get your midterm results, come see me now.